If you've logged into WebEx, please join the chat by emailing your questions or comments. And if you've called in and want to ask a question, you can email your question to foundation at virginiahospitalcenter.com. We'll answer as many questions as possible after hearing from our two guests. So let's get started. To my far right, Melody Dickerson is a chief nursing officer for Virginia Hospital Center. So Melody, I, I noticed at the checkpoint today when I came in that we had 315 people have been discharged, um, recovered from COVID. And that, that's, that's heartening to see that number keep getting higher and higher. On the other side of the equation, the modeling for uh, the number of new COVID-19 cases is projected, Northern Virginia has been projected um, that it would be going up at the end of April and beginning of May. And so um, can you talk a little bit about how the actual is against with the model? So, um, you know, when we first saw these models um, in, in March, I think um, I'll just speak for myself in saying that you know, we all thought that they were way off, that the peak wouldn't be that far out, that this was something in a couple of weeks that, you know, we would um, have seen the worst and, and kind of things would be getting um, headed in the direction of normal. Um, I think what we've seen over the last uh, couple of weeks in particular is that, you know, we have truly, um, we're truly seeing the, the peak. Um, we have been encouraged that um, over the last um, 24 to 48 hours, those numbers have gone down slightly. Um, we were well over 100 patients um, on, on Wednesday. We're at 98 um, today. Uh, 16 patients in our ICU, and of those in the ICU, 12 patients are on the ventilator. Um, and so we're hoping that, you know, while it's hard to say a, a day uh, makes a trend, it doesn't, we're hoping that we're coming off this. Um, it's certainly um, what the projection said would happen. And so uh, we hope, now we're hoping that the projection is true and we'll start seeing that improvement. Um, you know, I think. And in combination with that, we're also seeing um, more patients in general coming to the hospital. I think the, the belly pain and the, the other things that people um, just kind of suffered through and stayed at home for, um, they're, they're finding their way back into the hospital. Just, it's just gotten to a point where they can't um, hold off any longer. And so just overall, the hospital is about 95% capacity. We're really full. Um, so, uh, one thing that we're going to be doing next week and that we're working on right now is um, we've taken one of the hallways of the hospital that had previously been used for sleep rooms for our physicians. Um, and we're converting that space into a new patient care area. Um, many of you may know that we're building a new med surge floor on the fourth floor of the main tower, um, but it's not scheduled to open until September. So, um, because we know we can't um, hold patients in our emergency department right now um, with this uh, COVID pandemic going on, um, we're, we're creating new bed space. So we had ordered the beds for 4A, the physical bed that you would lay on. Um, we'll be using those on this temporary unit. It's an older unit, um, uh, but the, the gases and, and the um, mechanics of the, of the uh, area are sufficient to meet the needs of our patients. And so we're staffing for that. That unit should open on Wednesday and that'll give us an additional um, 18 beds um, to the hospital um, as we plan uh, for um, you know, increased volumes to continue. Um, in addition to um, these things, the governor order regarding elective procedures um, was lifted uh, today. Right. And, uh, and so, um, you know, uh, that, that business is going to return. We're not going to flip the switch and go back to hundred percent next week. And we're easing into it. Uh, but we do have a number of cases. And, and again, that volume had already started to come back over the last couple of weeks. Um, just because, you know, it got to the point where people couldn't wait any longer to have those elective. So elective doesn't necessarily mean, uh, that you're, you know, going to get your, Nip and tech done. It's it, you know, it's really the things you know, the hernia repairs and you know those other kind of elective procedures that that people don't want to have done, but they really need to get done. So um, so we're starting that. 
um, you know, Virginia Hospital Center is a safe place. We segregate our, our COVID mm -hmm. and our non-COVID patients. We know our protective equipment works. We've had, um, you know, we've not seen, I know in other parts of the world and even in our country, we've heard um, of healthcare workers contracting the virus while wearing their protective equipment. And we are simply just not seeing that. Um, uh, we know our protective equipment works to protect our employees and therefore, you know, protect our patients. And, um, and the no visitor policy is a big piece of that. Um, you know, we can, um, you know, protect ourselves, uh, we could protect our patients, but then if you add um, visitors into the mix, it just makes it harder for everyone to maintain that social distancing. Um, and, uh, and because this virus is so, um, unique in the fact that you can be um, contagious and not be symptomatic. It makes it just harder uh, than um, than other um, communicable diseases to um, to identify. So um, so our no visitor policy is uh, in effect with um, just a few exceptions. Of course, you know if it's an end of life situation or um, you know if you're having your child, you get to have one um, support person for that. Um, and we are checking the temperature of every individual healthcare worker and non healthcare worker alike um, to make sure that, you know, no one's um, unknowingly um, becoming febrile. Everyone is being provided with the mask. And uh, we've begun asking our patients even to wear masks. Um, you know, when I put on my mask, I'm reducing my risk of, um, of taking in COVID by about 65%. Uh, so if we're both wearing a mask, uh, you can see how that can um, certainly help. Um, we would, we are not, uh, the nurses are not being instructed to place a mask on a patient. Um, so only the people who can do that themselves and take the mask off themselves are, um, all, will be masked. Um, and uh, certainly anyone who were to experience any, um, any kind of concerns or shortness of breath or anything that, I mean, it's not a requirement. It's just something, it's a suggestion that we're asking everyone to do. Well, Melanie, that, I wanted to just uh, continue talking about um, the governor stays lifted. We're now having people coming on campus for procedures. So if I come on campus to get my knee replaced, um, how am I assured that it's gonna be safe and I'm gonna maintain my health? What, just quickly tell me a little bit about the protocol that maybe how it's changed. Yeah. Well, one of the uh, main things that we're doing is we are actually testing all our patients now. So um, at, at the other hospitals, I'm hearing um, that they're testing patients a day or two before the surgery, um, which we know if you're not symptomatic that having a test today doesn't tell us if you're gonna be positive two days from now. So out of the utmost um, caution, and, and frankly, our ability, because we have the rapid test capability, we're able now to test all patients when they come in and to make sure that they uh, don't unknowingly have the virus that you know, could be uh, shared to our employees. Um, we um, are certainly following all the things that, that, um, that I described before. Everyone's wearing a mask um, in the operating room. Everyone is uh, wearing the higher level mask um, for, uh, for the intubation and whatnot. Uh, we're doing that in a separate room. So uh, when everyone goes into the operating room, you can call it a closed system. Um, I'm already on a ventilator if I'm being intubated and, and uh, everyone in the room is garbed as such. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, after the fact, we are, um, you know, obviously making sure that our, um, uh, post-operative care is being uh, done in an environment where, um, you know, everyone's kept it safe or, you know, obviously continuing. We had a really high rate of hand hygiene compliance uh, prior to COVID, and that's only, you know, gotten better. We were already at the 99% for hand hygiene. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, we haven't seen the internal spread like some hospitals have. Um, I think it truly is a testament to that. Uh, and, um, and the cleaning of our facilities is just top notch. Um, you know, if there's uh, a patient who is a COVID positive patient, when they leave that room, we uh, do a, what we call a terminal clean of that room. Uh, and uh, we have a infrared light system that after the room is cleaned, 
uh, by, by individuals. Then we put this light in the room. That light cycles for 45 minutes. It's the same light that's used in operating rooms and other sterile areas. And um, it literally, that infrared light can actually kill viruses. And, uh, and so that runs for 45 minutes. No one's allowed to enter the room during that time frame. So, um, you know, Virginia Hospital Center has always been an immaculate, and very clean facility. Absolutely. Um, you know, any, it's, it's striking to anyone that walks in this place. And I would just say, you know, we've upped that game. That's fantastic. So I think the quick takeaway is it's safe to come in for a procedure that's non-COVID related, yeah. uh, whether it's inpatient or outpatient. And, um, and you know, again, leading the way because we're testing our employees and, and the patients when they came the day of, not prior to. So that's an important, important fact. Uh, let me transition over to our other guest. Kathy Turner is a director of corporate wellness for Virginia Hospital Center. And um, uh, Kathy, um, we had a chance last week to talk about the, um, uh, on our call last week, um, on our huddle, we talked last week about the importance of um, staying connected during this time of sheltering in place. And that, you know, it's really important to avoid isolation, stay connected. Um, it's difficult. If you consume too much media, you can tend to get a little bit down. But, you know, mental wellness is just, you know, maintain that mental edge is just one piece of it. The other piece is really is, is staying physically active. And that's much tougher now because um, all the great corporate wellness uh, classes that uh, people are used to coming to here in Arlington, um, those are those are not those have been postponed due to the, to the pandemic. So tell tell us a little bit about how you pivoted the program um, in this current time. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, um, I'm really proud of our team. Um, as soon as we found out, I think it was like March 14th or 16th that uh, things were being shut down. Um, within a week, we converted a, a lot of our programs to virtual. Um, we know for our corporate programs um, and our corporate partners that that employee engagement is so important and trying to keep their employees healthy, both mentally and physically is really critical any time of the year. I think even now um, it's more um, important. So we have a variety of um, lectures that we had already been doing via webinar. And what we did is we created some new ones, um, new content um, that related more to what we're going through. So maintaining healthy habits remotely, um, balancing work and home in the current climate, managing emotional wellness. Um, we also have the ability to do live via Zoom fitness classes, um, dietitian consultations. Um, we can even do electronic um, ergonomic assessments um, with folks because, wow. as you know, sometimes people's um, ergonomics at work is not very good. Um, what we found is when people work at home, it's even worse. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do to help improve the health of um, people's employees, but also to help them remain engaged with each other, which is just as important. Absolutely. Well, you you suggested uh, to me back at the first year to go to a stand up desk. I went to a stand up desk. Back pain's gone away, and I feel less lethargic in the afternoons because I'm standing and I'm getting better right. circulation. So great, great suggestion, and uh, that's wonderful that you're still able to do that. Another um, issue that's come up um, often um, over the last week to ten days is um, the fact that just like Virginia Hospital Center is going back to more of our slow but slowly but surely back to our normal type of business. A lot of other businesses are going back to opening up where and there's a concern about employee safety in the workplace. How do I make sure that my customers stay safe or my clients stay safe in the workplace? And um, so what can you suggest to um, our participants today around safety in the workplace? Right. Um, actually, that's something we've, we've already received a lot of inquiries from our corporate clients about that. And so we have put together a safe return to work um, kind of um, program for our corporate clients. Um, it's a scary time, right? We don't know. Um, and so as we come back, it's not, as Melody said, we're not just going to flip the switch at, at, at companies aren't just going to flip the switch either and then just to say, okay, everyone, we're back to normal. Um, so we have plans in place to help companies um, develop screening um, 
protocols because uh, as an organization who hasn't shut down, we've already had those in place for our own employees. So we can help companies um, with screening protocols, um, with doing temperature checks, if that's what they want, mass distribution. So if organizations are interested in getting help with that, we have the ability to not only help them with the policies, but to also help them with the manpower in terms of providing staff that can do temperature checks for them. So that's a great resource. Uh, Virginia Hospital Center Corporate Wellness making itself available to help bring companies back online to make their environment, their office or work environment safe for their employees, customers, and clients. Uh, so thanks, Kathy. We have a few questions. Uh, I'm gonna go to questions now if we can. Um, each week we've gotten more and more questions, so we wanted to start. So I think this first question um, actually is for Melody. Um, what uh, are we doing at Virginia Hospital Center to reach out to the local nursing homes or assisted living facilities? Yeah, we know that that is uh, definitely a very vulnerable population. And so we have maintained, uh, actually, I would say that this is really, this whole event has really strengthened our relationships with the, with the facilities that are, um, you know, what we consider part of our community. Um, we um, obtain daily numbers from them. Uh, some of them have really um, significant numbers of uh, patients in their facilities that have tested positive. Our uh, own staff have gone into these facilities and performed testing. We have taught the people that work in those facilities how to perform the testing. We actually are giving them the supplies to do so. So, um, you know, we feel like that that's a benefit to them to know what they're working with. It also helps us as a hospital to prepare if uh, those patients become so ill that they actually require a visit to the hospital, we'll know beforehand uh, what we're working with. Um, in addition to that, we've done training to help them, um, you know, with the entire PPE, the personal protective equipment, you know, how to don it, how to doff it. Um, the state's doing a great job of, of getting them those supplies, but certainly, um, I, you know, I'm really proud of our team for, for giving them that educational support and training for their staff to be able to operate safely. That's fantastic, Melody. Thank you. Here's a question for Kathy. Um, what are one or two things that a business um, or office um, that's coming back to work that they can do to immediately make the customers feel welcome and safe in our new normal? Right. Um, I think probably one of the first things is to um, make sure that they have some type of um, guidelines in place prior to opening, right? So we have time now to put that into place. What are my guidelines for, um, for current employees? And then if you're a business that has visitors, what are my guidelines gonna be for visitors, right? Because you might have two separate policies, one for your employees, one for visitors, and to start having that in place and then to start communicating that with your employees prior to the time that they're coming back on site. Very helpful, thank you. Um, here's a question for Melody here. So uh, if there's a positive test result, we have somebody who comes in that has a positive test result. Question is, does everyone admit to the hospital? I'm assuming they mean everybody in their family or their immediate um, living area. So person comes in, they're positive. What happens to everybody else that's been around that person? Right. It's really a question of tracing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. They, uh, so uh, if, if someone is positive, the instructions that are given to that individual are um, they should self-quarantine. Ideally, they would self-quarantine at home um, in, a, in a room where they had their own room and bathroom, okay? Um, if, if they don't, because not everyone has an ensuite bathroom, uh, it, uh, then uh, if they're sharing a bathroom, everyone's instructed to just do really thorough cleaning. So every time I go to the bathroom, I would take the bleach wipes uh, or bleach solution and clean the solid surfaces of the bathroom when I leave the bathroom, as well as very, very, obviously very frequent hand, hand hygiene. We would not automatically test everyone in the household. Uh, it, you know, the, the research is very clear that the likelihood of getting a false negative test is uh, very high if you're not symptomatic. So uh, only if someone were to become symptomatic would we, would we test everyone in the household. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the run of this virus is, going to be um, somewhere around seven to 14 days. And so uh, most people are safe to go back to work. Um, 
uh, once they've been uh, asymptomatic for at least uh, 48 hours. Uh, and that means no fever for at least 48 hours. The cough may linger a little bit. Um, it's not valuable really to retest, although um, I know you, you hear of that some. What I'm hearing is that the test is very sensitive. So you could be, you know, again, we don't really know all these things, but we think if you're, you know, once you've been symptomatic, you're not symptomatic, then, then it would be safe to return to work. Um, we, um, the test may take a while to clear. And so, um, you know, they're not necessarily retesting before they would allow people to go back to work. Thank you, Melody. Um, this is a two part question about uh, remdesivir. Is there, do we have any updates on the study? And I think there was an update this week. I have it actually. And then the second question, uh, second part of that question is uh, around availability of, of, the, of the drug. Okay. So, so um, there was an exciting uh, paper, I think probably everyone saw on the news yesterday, was yesterday, Wednesday, uh, where um, the preliminary studies are very good. So what they're finding is uh, overall that the, that the drug reduces the length of illness from 15 days to 10 days. Um, and so, I mean, 10 days is still a long time, but cutting five days off of that is very significant. Um, they, so we have 13 people enrolled in the remdesivir study here. It is still a study. And so we just don't get as much of the drug as, as we would like to get. Uh, we would certainly like to put it on more patients, but we're held to very strict criteria and they have to meet um, the criteria to be enrolled in the study. And so um, of those 13 patients who are enrolled in the study and have received the drug, we've had six patients be discharged. That's, that's great, great news to hear in, indeed. Um, and the convalescent plasma, you want me to talk about that too? I was going to just uh, thank you very much. It's like we even practiced this. <laughs> Go right ahead. Uh, so the convalescent plasma uh, is, is going well. Uh, I would say for both these treatments, the jury's still out. Uh, whether this is a silver bullet, it's interesting because even amongst our eye infectious disease physicians, there's mixed reviews. Like one of them will think that, you know, the remdesivir is like the best thing ever. Uh, and the other one's like, oh, I'm not so sure about this. So um, that's why we're in studies, right? Uh, so convalescent plasma, we have 10 patients enrolled in that study. And uh, the problem has been with convalescent plasma is we can get you enrolled, but then actually getting the plasma is taking quite a bit of time. Uh, it's taking about five days to get the plasma. So, um, you know, we all wonder, if it would be more beneficial if the day I sign you up, I could just give you uh, the, the plasma. So um, it, plasma is a blood product. So um, what they do is they take someone who has had the virus and then they uh, go to the blood, to the Red Cross and they um, give blood and they spin that blood down to just the plasma, which is the part that really holds these antibodies. And um, so obviously, um, you know, it's reliant on donors who will participate, donors who meet criteria to participate, and, um, and then getting the blood typing because, you know, um, if I'm O positive, I can't necessarily get, um, you know, someone who's AB uh, positive's blood. So there's all those specifics. Um, so again, the jury's out, we're very, uh, I mean, we just feel so very fortunate to be a part of both these studies. Um, it's amazing uh, to be on the cutting edge of this. And um, as soon as we, you know, start seeing, um, you know, improvements or, you know, what we, what we're coming up with and, um, you know, we'll just be certainly ready to share. Well, thanks, Melody. You know, being part of the Mayo uh, Clinic Care Network really speaks so highly of the quality of care and research that's being done here at Virginia Hospital Center. Um, so then you get noticed in Gilead Sciences and other pharmacology companies, uh, they come knocking. So not, not a big surprise when you know about how uh, exceptional the care is here. Um, back to Kathy. Uh, Kathy, if somebody needed some um, advice and counsel from you around um, either their own, how to stay uh, personally um, active during this time, or if they're trying to open their office or business, um, what's the best way for them to contact you? Sure. So um, either they can um, email HealthWorks at Virginia Hospital Center. HealthWorks is our corporate wellness program, or they can call our office at 703-558-6740.
That's great. HealthWorks, or you can call directly, and we'll have that information on our uh, micro site. So um, I wanted to thank uh, Melody and Kathy for this important briefing today, and we're so grateful for the leadership that you both are providing and um, and the, what our clinical team's doing to you know, try to keep our community healthy. Um, I also want to thank all the members um, of the community for the support that they're providing, uh, whether it's meals, um, uh, donated uh, in-kind materials, PPE, or cash contributions. We've raised over $650,000 toward a goal of 1 million, and that's fantastic. The uh, community stepped up. So I want to say thank you to everybody for that. And if you'd like more information, you can visit us on the web at www.bhcfoundation dot com forward slash COVID-19 COVID-19 and that's the end of our huddle for this week we're going to hit the pause button next week we won't have a huddle on Friday uh, but on Friday May 15th at 1 30 p.m we'll be back and I'm sure we'll have more progress to share and Melody one just final one, thought just one more final thought just sure. to remind everyone next week is nurses week that's uh, right yeah. thank you so so you know uh, obviously, a lot of things are changed this year. Um, yeah. We're not getting to do the Friends of Nursing Gala, but um, I think some videos will be shared as That's we right. celebrate our nurses here and the uh, generous donations from our Friends of Nursing donors who make these scholarships and continuing ed uh, opportunities available to our nurses. It's truly amazing. So, well, thank you. Put a plug in. Absolutely, Melody. Thank you for that reminder. Friends and uh, Friends of Nursing, thank you, folks, for your support for the scholarship program. And I would say hug a nurse, but we have to be socially distanced, so we cannot hug a nurse. <laughs> There'll be a virtual hug of nurse. Right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.